please come in, and uh, we'll invite you to take your seats as, as promptly as, uh, as you can. There is seating sporadically throughout the auditorium, this great King Center, so please uh, find one at your convenience, and, and bear in mind, we're going to be talking to you about those seats, because that later. Just by way of introduction or reintroduction as the case may be, Jim Drake is my name and I have the privilege of serving as the fifth president of Brevard Community College and I also have the privilege of welcoming all of you to this 12th installment of the B.W. Simpkins Seminar for Entrepreneurial Development. Now there's just a couple of administrative announcements if you would bear with me as you're taking your seats. We ask all of you to remain in your seats until the lecture is over, and that will include a question and answer period that's built into the end of uh, this hour that we'll be together. Uh, also, and I, I'm going to remind myself to do it too, I have, I, I'm a slave to one of these Blackberries and cell phones, but as with any lecture, would you, would you put your cell phones uh, or any other electronic devices in what, what I'm, I, I'm told is the the manner mode now. Now the manner mode apparently means vibrate off or whatever, but just so that no cell tone ringing, that would sure help us. We'd appreciate it if you would do so. Now at the end of the lecture, toward the end of it, there will be time to ask questions as I say, and index cards are going to be provided to you from each side of the aisles here, so please jot down your questions on the index cards, and then we have student ambassadors who will be collecting them, and then those questions will be posed to our guest uh, speaker and guest of honor today, Mr. Gail Lemmerin. Now, putting together a series like this, as you, as you can well imagine, takes the collective efforts of an awful lot of people, and I'd like to acknowledge the staff of Community and uh, Marketing, Community Relations and Marketing, which is headed by Vice President Jim Ross, who is here with us today, and also the lecture committee members for the Simpkins series for pulling all of this together today. Also, a special thanks to uh, our chairman of the lecture committee, Professor Pat Fuller, the committee co-chair, Ms. Vicki Peake, who is with us, and she is also the director, as some of you may know, of the BCC Small Business Center. Definitely, we want to thank the faculty of Brevard Community College, your faculty, and also participants from our area public schools and also our private schools for taking time to introduce their students, all of you, to the spirit of entrepreneurship. This unique and special lecture series would certainly not be possible without the largesse, the financial support of its namesake, Bernard W. Simpkins. As you can read in the program brochure, this series brings to Brevard Community College, and by extension to Brevard County, nationally known visionaries who have built businesses based on a hope, a dream, and some really hard work. An entrepreneur in his own right who has made his own indelible mark on Brevard County. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Bernie Simpkins. Thank you, Dr. Drake, and thank all of you for coming. There wouldn't be much of a purpose in this if you did not attend, especially the college professors, the presidents of the individual colleges that get their students here. It's uh, just a great opportunity for them and for us and for the speaker to have all of you in the audience. And I want to express my appreciation to Dr. Drake and the Brevard Community College for having these sessions of events, and the purpose, of course, of which is to give a vision to you students as to something that might be possible that you did not first or before now realize would be possible. And that's the purpose of these speakers coming and talking to you and letting you ask them questions. Uh, you're going to be very charmed and pleased with the speaker today. He's, uh, yesterday's speaking was outstanding, a lot of good questions, and so we'll just enjoy it. Uh, you'll hear more about that in the record. Um, first, I want to, to present a scholarship and I don't think the student is here just yet, but we are giving a scholarship, a $1,000 scholarship, to two students each year for their participation, and they have been chosen because of their potential entrepreneurship and their, and their business. 
Dr. Cobb will tell you about it. Thank you. On behalf of the scholarship committee, it is our pleasure to inform you that Kimberly Noel True from the Titusville campus is the recipient of the uh, first annual B.W. Simpkins uh, scholarship. Kimberly is a student at the Titusville campus who double majoring in business administration and um, hospitality management. Kimberly is a non-traditional student as well, and she came back to school after getting her GED in North Carolina. And here she is. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Dr. Cobb. <laughs> Dr. Drake insists that I give these students just a couple of thoughts, positive thoughts. The first of which is one that I've stated at a previous seminar. The early bird gets the worm, meaning, of course, the one that gets up and gets with it every day and starts about their task and their studies and their responsibilities is the person that succeeds in life. You don't get much done lying in bed, so get to bed a little early if you need to get up early. The other thing is that we are judged and we're, our life is much dependent upon our attitude in life. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we embrace for that day. We cannot change our past we cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we react to what happens to us. And so it's up to you. We are in charge of our attitudes. So keep a positive attitude, enjoy each day by having a good attitude, and, and study hard and get to work as early as you can. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Pat Fuller, Chair of the Bernie W. Simpkins Entrepreneurial Lecture Series. And uh, today is our 12th in an ongoing series of outstanding presenters and uh, speakers uh, from uh, all over the country. Let me point out again that events like this would not be possible except for the efforts of a whole lot of people. I would like to recognize and thank the BWS committee, college staff, the provosts, instructors, and of course our stage crew. And most importantly, our sponsors, Florida Today, and Managing Editor, Bob Stover. And finally, especially you, our audience, for attending. Thank you so much. I want to remind students to pick up attendance cards as you leave today for your instructors. I want to also encourage you to jot down questions as early as you can so that we can get them up to our presenters and they can answer your question while you're here today. So please begin to fill those out. They will be picked up in, uh, shortly. So write questions for Mr. Lemoran on the card. Our guest speaker today, folks, certainly deserves a great and lengthy introduction for all of his accomplishments in life. 
starting out as a teen in various enterprises and building a company from scratch in northern Michigan that he sold for over $150 million. Joining Mr. Limeron today is Mr. Ed Wilkes, author, lecturer, businessman from St. Augustine. I suppose much more could be said, but perhaps the best tribute to Gail Limeron is his book by his biographer, Ed Wilkes, as told by this film. Gail Limeron was born and raised in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where he was the first member of his family to graduate from high school. He began his entrepreneurial career at the tender age of 10 as a paperboy. As a teenager, he washed trucks for the local power company and went from high school to the Merchant Marines, where a few parts of the boat escaped his scrubbing and scraping. Gail went from the sea to the sky when he enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. Community College is honored to present to you Mr. Gail Leveron. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it very much. Uh, been a long Mr. Uh, Simpkins is uh, in charge of hospitality around here. And it's been a long time since I was a kid, in fact, uh, that I slept on a couch, but I think I'll make it through this uh, talk. Uh, I ex fully expected to see Mrs. Simpkins, who's a wonderful cook, uh, at my place at about <clears throat> me, 7 o'clock this morning, but she didn't show, and so we went to uh, uh, IHOP, Ed and I went to IHOP, and I left her typical 40% uh, uh, tip on, on, the, on the chat. So. Anyway, uh, I see that they did introduce my sidekick here, uh, Ed. Uh, Ed claims to have written my book, and I want you to know that I worked on it for a couple of years before I handed it off to him. I wanted to make sure that I uh, was around to finish it. So he did a great job uh, on the book, and I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here, Ed. Uh, the reason Ed is here is going to be the facilitator here and ask me questions. Uh, I am a professional entrepreneur. I am not a professional speaker. In fact, this is my second uh, appearance on a stage like this. Uh, yesterday was number one, so I've come a long way in uh, two days here. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I did see the uh, video uh, there, and uh, I want you guys to know that uh, the insulation business was my, my first business venture at the age of 40. Didn't have any money. So uh, it took me a long time to save up enough money to, to start that. And by that time, I had about $20,000 worth of stock in a company and used that to uh, start the business with some credit uh, from a supplier. Uh, that's one of the toughest things about starting a business. You might have a good idea, but coming up with the, the funds to start the business is, uh, is the tough part. And uh, Ed and I are going to talk about that some more uh, a little later on. Uh, so I started in a barn in the western Chicago suburbs uh, in 1974 during a recession in the uh, construction business. And whether it's a depression or a recession depends upon which business you're in. If you're in construction during a slow time, it's a depression, believe me. Uh, so I started at a barn there with a, a couple of trucks and no salespeople uh, in a very cyclical uh, a business, you know, every four or five years, there's ups and downs in, in the construction business. And so um, immediately I said, you know, if I'm going to be in this business, I'm going to have to diversify geographically. So I set out uh, looking at the economy, and I noticed that it wasn't a uh, national economy. When some places are up, some, some states are down, and some uh, cities in various states are, are um, getting along better than others. And so Part of my strategy was to diversify uh, nationally as soon as I can. I had 12,000 competitors, and with the grace of God and a lot of great people, uh, we were able to, in a 
in what, 20 years to become number one in the country, which I'm so thankful for. So I'm uh, here living the American dream, I like to say. I, I came from a small town in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, we had uh, running water, we sort of run, run down the hill after it and run back with it. Uh, we had two-seater outhouses and th things like that, and so it's been a, been a great ride. But anyway, uh, with no further ado, I think we'll just get to the questions. The first thing to ask is, uh, why did you decide to go into business, to leave the security of a, of a paycheck? Well, my paycheck wasn't that secure. Um, when I graduated from high school, the first thing I did was go in the Merchant Marine for a few months. And then I joined the Air Force for four years. Uh, spent about a year and a half in Korea. And I learned a lot about administration in the uh, Air Force. When I got back from Korea, I became an instructor in the Air Force and a and personnel uh, specialist instructor. Uh, when I was discharged, I decided to go to a community college at night under the GI Bill. And I attended the college for about two years uh, at night under that GI Bill. And I studied accounting. And uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to go to school and study accounting and also work in accounting uh, during the day. And that's what I did. I worked for Old Celebrator Company in St. Louis in the cost accounting department, went to school at night. Then I worked for Alcola, Aluminum Company of America uh, in the accounting department while I was continuing to go to school. Never did get my associate's degree, I'm sorry to say. Um, from that point, uh, I decided uh, to become a salesman, so I, so I sold full of brushes door to door, sold aluminum siding door to door, learned a little bit about selling, learned, sold the vacuum cleaners door to door. I'm building up to this because that's how I got into business. Uh, then I worked, went to work for a building material manufacturer for six, seven years selling material and found that out that found out that I was a pretty good salesman. And then went to work for an insulation contractor in Chicago as a salesman, and I eventually became branch manager a small branch. Uh, these people uh, had a home office in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and in 1974, they wanted me to move to Phoenix from Chicago to, uh, to operate their businesses out west, and I didn't want to go, and so I kind of fell into it. I, I backed into it, and so the point is, all of these uh, experiences that I had uh, over these years finally came together and it was an opportunity to uh, buy out this insulation company. And uh, so I bought out this small insulation company. Uh, the owner of it decided he wanted to make an investment with me. And so he, uh, he invested $16,000. I thought it'd be a good idea because he was a big name in the industry. And so he invested $16,000 and uh, turned out to be a good investment because I think three years later I gave him $3 million back uh, so it was a good investment for him. Uh, that's how I got into it. I kind of backed into it, got uh, financing from a supplier, used the little money that I had, and uh, uh, bought his trucks and uh, customer list. And uh, they were actually my customers and, and went from there. And you the were, rest you is were, history. You were good at sales, and were, were there other traits or qualities that you thought you yeah, had, I had uh, beneficial? Yeah, over the years I had learned about budgeting and business plans and uh, administration, uh, and I was pretty good with numbers, I was good with accounting. And so, uh, as an entrepreneur, I found that I had to do all of those things at first. I was very, very conservative, starting you know, by myself, helping them load the trucks. Uh, Actually, dragging insulation through the manure, it was, it was really fun. Uh, it was a fun time, uh, and everybody working together was just, just great. Let's talk about some of the traits that you think are necessary for a person to become a successful entrepreneur. Well, number one, I think you have to be a risk taker. Uh, you have to be a gambler at heart. Uh, starting a new business is uh, very risky. Uh, You've got to have a lot of perseverance. You've got to, as Bernie says, you've got to get up early and go to bed late. Uh, you have to have a good work ethic. Uh, and I think you have to be a people person uh, <coughs> with a goal. Now, you, 
You mentioned earlier about uh, going to college, uh, to a junior college. Tell us about the importance or not of uh, what you think regarding education for yeah, I think an entrepreneur. Edu yeah, education is very, very important. It's much more important today, I think, than it was uh, when I was doing this. Uh, that's one of the things I really regret. I missed out on, on the higher education, and it's one of the reason I, reasons I support uh, higher education today. Excuse me. Uh, you know, with the new technology that's out there, it's very, very difficult, I think, to start a business of any kind without, without uh, education. So if you had had the college education, you think you would have grown a lot quicker and... Yeah, I'd have probably done it when I was... 25 instead of 40, you know, and so it saved a lot of years. And the other thing that I uh, <clears throat> didn't have, which I think is available to all you guys, is uh, I didn't have a mentor. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little cold here. Um, I didn't have anybody to talk to. And I think that probably the wisest thing you guys could do if you were thinking of being your own boss and being an entrepreneur would be to find somebody who's been there and talk to them. Usually older people are very willing to share their experiences and you don't have to necessarily pay attention to everything they say and do everything they say, but uh, we've all made mistakes and uh, you don't have to make the same mistakes that I made. You're going to make enough of your own. So I think mentoring is a real important thing and what's happening here today is very important. Uh, I know we went to Daytona Beach Community College a couple of nights ago where there was a speaker and they're just starting uh, uh, this type of uh, a session and you guys are light years ahead of Daytona Beach Community College at this time. Now you, you have often quoted the phrase, bet on the jockey. What do you mean by that and why is that such an important thing? Yeah. Excuse me. Well, as I was building my business, I was setting up branches in different parts of the state and then different parts of the country and I ended up with over a hundred locations around the country. So I did a lot of traveling. And all of these I set them up as independent uh, companies. And the reason I set them up as independent companies is because I wanted to reward the management of those companies for the job they did, not in the overall performance of the entire uh, corporation. Uh, and uh, I would do my best to find a great location as I was scouting for a new location or a new acquisition of a competitor. And uh, I found out real soon, and I'm learning this even today, that, um, that you can have a great location or a great site or a great business, but if you don't have great management, you're darn lucky to be successful. And on the other hand, you can have uh, a mediocre location uh, with, with great management uh, and be successful. So I've taken mediocre people and put them in a great market and had a failure. And then I've taken great people in a, uh, uh, a mediocre market and had a real big winner. So I say bet on, the, bet on the jockey or bet on the management, bet on the people. Uh, I also made it a practice to surround myself as I grew, surround myself with great people. We promoted usually from within. Uh, we, 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 we paid our people very well. Uh, I made a statement uh, yesterday that uh, we really were very demanding as far as work is concerned. We, you know, hire you know, two people to do the work of four, or one person to do the work of three, and, and pay them for one and a half or two. And uh, it's much easier to supervise the fewer people. I mean, it was much more rewarding for them. And uh, so uh, many entrepreneurs are, uh, are insecure and they're concerned about hiring people that might be a little brighter than themselves or have a talent that they don't have. And it, just the opposite should be true. You should, and I did this. I went out and I surrounded myself with the best people people that are highly educated, their technical uh, knowledge, and so on and so forth, and they really complemented uh, what I was good at. And what I was mainly good at was negotiating and uh, selling and uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Now, in just a minute, we're going to take some, uh, some of the questions from the audience. But yeah. before we do that, uh, one quick question that I'm sure a lot of people would like to know is, 
How do you finance a business? Say you've got a great idea to start a business, uh, how do you finance it? Well, I told you how I started mine. Um, in, my, uh, in my new life here, I, I'm involved with a, quite a few young entrepreneurs that, that I've financed uh, in the startup of their business. I find someone with good work ethic, uh, some, some background uh, in a business, and uh, I've joined them uh, in the business and sat on the board and counseled them, but still stayed under the day-to-day -day operations and, 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 and financed that growth. Because one of my, uh, one of my pleasures today, and has been for you know, 10 years now, the last 10 years, is see people grow in business. And so I've been very involved with that, and I've made a lot of money uh, through other people's efforts. Uh, and then uh, there are all kinds of ways to start a business. Uh, some people uh, mortgage their house. Some people borrow money from uh, their relatives and friends. You can go to uh, uh, the capital markets. You can go to a bank if you've got good enough credit. That's usually pretty tough uh, when you're first starting. Uh, but there are just, just a lot of ways to start a business. It's tough. It's probably the toughest thing is to find a way. And there are people with great ideas, and they're afraid to take a risk. And so they never get that idea off the ground. Uh, if you're not a risk taker, you don't need to be an entrepreneur. And, and I note that young people, as they're going to school, and I think this is good, most of the young people that I know that go to college, they don't really know what they want to do for a couple of years, and then they get a major, and so on and so forth. They're going to be a doctor, or a lawyer, or uh, work for a company, uh, be a salesman, or, or they want to be in business for, as an entrepreneur. Uh, and I think that is good, that, that they wait, because I say if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to look around. You don't have to, have the, you don't have to reinvent that wheel. You can look around and see a very successful business, and maybe go to work at that business for a while and learn the business and go to work for a couple, two, three similar businesses and find out if you, number one, do you enjoy, do you enjoy what you're doing? And then just set, take their idea and go down the block, go down the street, go to another city and uh, start that same business uh, on your own. So it doesn't have to be an original idea. Okay, let's take some of the questions. We've got a lot of questions. You said that you were tried to. You said you tried to surround yourself with the best people possible. What kind of traits were you looking for? Uh, number one, education. As, as I grew, number one, education. But number two, real good work, work ethic. Uh, honest people. Uh, a lot of drive. Goal goal oriented people. Uh, I, I said that we promoted from within, and we did. Uh, I'm in a restaurant business now, and we've got, in one of our companies, we've got 17 locations, and I'm slowing it up now because we've run out of qualified people. And, and I, I know better than to start a, a, another uh, branch, unless I've got the right people on the, on the bench waiting to, to get there. And so, uh, I always look for people who are trainable, and it's not the nicest thing to say, but, I, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, you know, to, and I put this in the book, to, um, to win the Kentucky Derby, you don't you know, take a jackass and try to train a jackass. Uh, you start with a thoroughbred, because a trained jackass is still a jackass. And so, I mean, <laughs> that's it. And uh, so, you need to start with a thoroughbred. And so when you're, when you're out trying to hire people, very, very important to hire the right person. You can spend so much time and money on training. Okay, the next one. What was the hardest part in building your own business? The hardest part? Finding the right people, uh, I'd say. And uh, when I started, it was, uh, it was heavily unionized in the Chicago market. It was tough dealing with the union. I got along great with the, with the, uh, with the workers. In fact, I found them to be even the best workers, frankly. But it was tough dealing with the union officials. Uh, and I think the no next toughest thing that I encountered was uh, dealing with accounts receivable, you know, dealing with builders and the builders on it. Their favorite saying is, you know, the checks in the mail, and the mail never got, get, got there. So I had to spend a lot of time uh, on accounts receivable. All right, you're in a lot of different businesses, and here's a question. How do you evaluate new business opportunities? 
very carefully. Uh, I try to do uh, due diligence on it, uh, look at what the competition is. of the area, the demand, the profitability, the competition, just do a whole bunch of study and come up with a business plan, budgets on the area, uh, to see if it's, if, the, if I like to say, is the pot worth the ante? And if the pot's worth the ante, we take a, a, a run at it. What's the main advice you would give to a person who wants to start their own business or businesses? Be prepared to work hard, uh, at least in the early days. You know, I, I didn't do a good job of balancing my family life with my business life. I worked you know, many, many, many hours, seven days a week, for years without a vacation. Uh, I, I think uh, that you need to do a better job of balancing your family life with your, with your business. Uh, but you've got to know that it, at least in the early days, that you're just going to be spending a whole bunch of time a whole bunch of time working uh, and uh, away from family, uh, and that you are taking a risk, and you need the support. If you have a family, you need the support of that family because it is it is risky. What business would you start today if you were just starting? I'm sorry, an insulation contracting <laughs> company. Uh, I'm involved with you know maybe twenty odd different types of businesses now. Uh, uh, Bernie asked me the other day, why would you ever sell a an insulation company and uh, that you're doing well in and going to restaurant business. Well, I am. You know, I'm in five restaurant concepts with about 40 or 45 different restaurants with five concepts. Um, and I wouldn't start a restaurant. The reason I got in it, and I'm in it, and we're doing very, very well. We're, it's a risky business, and I'm a gambler, and I like the risk. It was risky dealing with builders, and it's risky dealing with in the restaurant business, it's uh, there's a lot of failure in the restaurant business, uh, but it's challenging and it's fun. And the reason I'm in business today is it's fun. And um, but I'd start an insulation contracting company. In fact, I'm thinking about going back into business. My non-compete is up. I'm thinking about going back in and sell my business again to the same Fortune 200 company. <laughs> Despite your many successes in life, are there any goals from the past that you did not achieve and wish you had? Yeah, I wish, number one, I wish I had uh, balanced uh, my life better between uh, family and business. And uh, very close, number two, I wish I had my uh, degree. I do have a, an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Florida. By the way, I didn't ask you guys, are there any gators out there? Yeah. Okay, I got away with that yesterday. Um, but, uh, and then I've got a, uh, I don't even need a lawyer because I have an honorary uh, law degree from Bethune-Cookman College. <laughs> so I don't need lawyers anymore. I don't need doctors. I don't need lawyers. Uh, and I have an honorary associate's degree from uh, Daytona Beach Community College. I served uh, with a lot of uh, doctors. And I was worried about this at first. I served, the governor appointed me. I was eight years on DBCC's board. I spent several years on uh, Embry Reynolds Board of Directors, uh, several years on Bethune Cookman's Board of Directors, and uh, had a lot of fun around education. How do you keep going when you're let down? When you're let down, when you, when you have a failure, uh, and certainly we've had failures, and I've had failures, and I'm going to have more. But when I have a failure, I look beyond it and I, and I try to look for an opportunity. Nine times out of ten, I find an opportunity behind every failure. I think, oh, what did I do wrong and what could I do to kind of do an end around on this thing and uh, really think through it. And finding an opportunity, I think, is the biggest thing that can perk you up. The next sale or the, the next big challenge. I look at failure as an opportunity. Yeah. Was there anyone who inspired you to accomplish your goals? Oh boy, not since I was that high. We had a uh, an insurance salesman in my little town. And I think he made ten thousand dollars a year, and I think he was probably the richest guy in town. And I thought and he had a, he was a debit route for metropolitan life, and I remember him. And I said, boy, this guy's got to be the richest guy in town, and 
I want to do that someday. And I never had a vision, by the way, of being in, uh, being in business for myself. I thought that I'd end up as a sales manager somewhere, uh, or uh, stay in the military, or do this or like that. And, and it just so happened, uh, and I'm happy that it did. What would you invest in to have the biggest financial gain? Example, stocks or real estate? I'm heavily involved in real estate, and I think it's great. It has its ups and downs. I think uh, timing is important in acquisitions, by the way. I think time right now and in the next few months is great timing to buy real estate, bad time to be selling real estate. Um, uh, I think something like, uh, I'm pretty heavily involved in natural gas. I think, I think that is good. Uh, investing in people is the biggest thing. Uh, we, we talked uh, yesterday about making money, and money is not everything. It happens to be the, the bottom line, and for entrepreneurs, it's, you know, that's, that's how you gauge your success, really, is how much money do you make. And it's important to have fun along the way, though, but I say there's, as far as I know, there's only three ways to make money, and I tried to do all of these, and uh, work hard and make a certain amount of money. Like a doctor could make a certain amount of money by himself. Uh, and then you can have your money working for you, and I always tried to do that. Instead of spending my money that I made, I would invest it in a new branch somewhere. So I never had a lot of cash. had a lot of debt, not much cash. And then ended up having a lot of people working for me. When I sold my company, I had 5,000 people working for me. So that's where you make the real money. The most people, the more people you have working for you, the more money you're gonna make. And uh, so I tried to do th all three things at the same time, which really helped me because I was showing leadership to the, to the people that I work with. And uh, being very, very fair to all of those people. I paid them very, very well. Uh, I guess I can tell the story here that when I sold my company to Masco, I don't know if you guys know Masco, but they're a Fortune 200 company. They own Delta Fawcett and 75 other companies. My division right now is number three. They do $14 million in uh, sales, and uh, my inst installation division did three of that $14 million. But when I sold out, uh, for an area of $150 million, and I'm not trying to brag, I'm just trying to tell you the facts. Um, at the closing dinner, the president of Masco, after everything was signed, he called me into a separate office, and he threw his arms around me, and welcomed me to the company, and he said, hey, I, here's this. And he gave me a, a stock certificate for $500,000 with a Masco stock. I said, what's this? You know, the deal's all done. So I just want to welcome you into the family, and so you know how smart that guy was. I was going to, I had a five year commitment to him, and I was going to really bust my tail to, to do a real great job for them. I mean, he was a great guy. And he said, I want to give you some more advice. I said, fine, I'm listening to your advice. Uh, I had a $25 million earnout, and in five years, if I made them $80 million, I'd get this $25 million earnout, or any part of it. Uh, pro rata up to that uh, percentage of the 80 million. He said, what you do is share it with some of your people. So I thought about that and I said, well, what a great idea. And so I went to the top 10 or 12 people that I had, and uh, including my secretary, and I said, guys, I'm going to give you 20% of whatever I make. So instead of five years, we made uh, $25 million, and they made, 20, they made five million in three years. So that was, uh, I think, a good story. One of the things you mentioned was uh, debt. Uh, what was your philosophy on taking on debt as you were growing your business? Well, when I sold my company, I owed $27 million. And in those days, it was a lot of personal guarantees on this. Masco took care of that, thank Kevin. <laughs> and I slept more easily uh, after that. Um, if you want to grow very gradually, you know, you can keep your debt down. But I was always wanting to grow more rapidly and expand, and so uh, I think that's fine as long as you've uh, analyzed the risk and, and you have debt for the right thing uh, and the, to grow your company in the right place. And again, is the pot worth the ante? And you know, should I do that? And 
I've always uh, operated on debt. I operate on debt today uh, as we're growing a lot of our businesses. Another question related to education. How did not having a college degree or education affect finding the right employees? And would you take into account experience over education? I don't think it had much of an effect on me. I, uh, like I say, I was not afraid to surround myself with uh, educated, bright people. And uh, uh, they probably took one look at me and they said, man, I can, uh, I can bring a lot to this company, and uh, they're probably anxious to go to work for me because they knew a lot. They knew, they knew uh, their part of the, uh, the job a heck of a lot better than I did, and they knew that I, that I would need them. And so I, I was able to attract some very good people. Do, do all of your businesses or ideas make money? No. Uh, all of my businesses that I've been hands-on and have made money, most of the businesses where I've delegated have made money, but there's been some exceptions. Uh, thank heaven that most of them have, uh, have been winners. Um, you know, right now, um, I want to tell you this, I, I, uh, I've only invented one thing in my life, and uh, I invented uh, something I call Sanador, which is an uh, automatic exit system for public restrooms. Uh, a few years ago, I won't give you all the gory details, but there was a, a cook in, a, in this fancy club. He walked into the kitchen out of the restaurant without washing his hands, and I'm thinking, so I got him fired, by the way. I'm thinking, what has got to be? Everything is touch free in a, in a restroom. I mean, the faucets, the commodes, the paper towels, everything. And I did a patent search, and nobody had thought of a touch free exit. So I, uh, I got a patent on it. And I'm just involved right now with marketing that. It's called Sanador, and it's a I think it's probably going to end up being the biggest thing that I ever did in my life. It's just uh, a great deal. Cost. Installed uh, about $1,200 a door, but uh, I've got some international patents as well as national, and uh, I think it's going to be a big, a big winner. So that's another way you can start a business is come up with a, an original idea like this. And the reason I mentioned that at this time is I haven't been hands-on, but to get this thing off the ground, it's not moving as fast as. Uh, as I'd hoped it would, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get very involved in that for a short period of time. Have you ever experienced a major disappointment in your career, and how did you overcome it? Well, I've had some branches that I've closed <laughs> and gone on and opened a uh, branch at another location. Uh, I've had uh, some people that I've been very uh, disappointed in and uh, severed a relationship with those people and hired the right person and gone on from there. And did my best to overcome whatever the, the situations were all different then. If you were starting a new company with a revolutionary product, what is the best way to get consumer confidence? And you're kind of experiencing that, I guess, with Santa Claus. Yeah, and it's not the consumer. I'm, I've been trying to market this for a few months, and not the consumer. It's the uh, it's the restaurant owners, an example. They don't want to spend the money on this door. The consumers just love it. I mean, love it. When you when you think that uh, this is a heck of a number, but I've done a study. You know, sixty percent of guys and forty percent of women do not wash their hands when they leave the public restroom, and uh, that's why you see people like me that use a paper towel. That's why you see receptacles by the door. And so getting to the consumer is the important thing. Of course, we've got these in all my uh, restaurants. And it's more than restaurants. I've got them in hotels, motels, uh, hospitals, uh, nursing homes, universities. I've got them in many places. I've got them in McDonald's, there's trial. I've got them in some of Darden's restaurants. But it's getting to the restaurant owner or the building owner uh, and so I'm working on a way to get to the consumer now, and it has to do with, with internet and a blog on the so internet. How do, how do you think is the best way for a startup company to gain consumer confidence? Well, uh, of course, I don't know what, which, which kind of a business we're talking about. So I've not had much uh, experience dealing directly with the consumer. I, my experience has been dealing with the builder, or um, 
that type of experience. So as far as restaurants are concerned, I'm not directly involved in it, but what we do is, in fact, I've done this in every one of my businesses, we, we give our customer, whether it's a consumer or a builder or a building owner, we give them more than they expect to receive. You know, if you give someone more than they expect to receive, you're going to have a winner. And uh, in my installation business, I, you know, I bought lower than anybody in the country. I did all my buying personally. Uh, my competitors made three to five percent, and I made seventeen percent net. And the reason I made seventeen percent is even though I was buying at a lower price, I was charging three to four percent more than anybody else because we were doing a better job. We get there on time, do a better job, not hold anybody up, and it was worth that much uh, to the builders, as an example. So, giving people more than they expect to receive, I think, is, is the answer. How can a startup company be considered by you as one you would be interested in advising? What type? Uh, a startup company, uh, what type of startup company might be uh, one that you would be interested in advising? A startup company that I'd be interested in advising? Uh, how, how, can they, how can they go about getting you to consider something like that? Mm. Uh, well, I gave everybody a uh, Bernie's email address yesterday, I guess I better not do that today. <laughs> um, I'm really starting to back off on that. Uh, I know people uh, who, who, who are involved with that. Uh, I'm, I'm so spread so thin that, um, that, I, that I really don't want to get involved in that uh, at this point. There are, uh, there are clubs, there are, there are organizations like I mentioned the executive committee, uh, tech, which is the executive committee, which is a group of uh, sometimes entrepreneurs and sometimes <laughs> professionals that get together and exchange ideas. And uh, uh, I was a member of that for a long time, and I learned a lot uh, through that system. What are the top three ways you can find uh, good employees? For example, advertising or recruiters or competitions? Well, I think I've found the, the best employees through referral from friends of mine. Um, next, uh, we've used the recruiters to test them. Uh, and um, I found some very good referrals from current employees. From current employees, can, in fact, we've even offered rewards many times to current employees to, uh, you know, to, to attract uh, new people. Uh, okay. Here's a good one. How do I become a millionaire? <laughs> well, you need a lot of help from the Lord, and you need a lot of uh, good luck, and, you, and I think you've got to uh, work real hard. Of course, you can win the lottery. Uh, it's a um, million dollars today is not what a million dollars was a few years ago. Uh, so there are a lot of millionaires out there. And I think, I think if you start your own business, just about in any business today, you can become a, become a millionaire. Uh, whether you can do it in one location depends upon the business you're in, you know. But um, not a lot of money today. Uh, how can you become a multi-millionaire should be the, uh, the, uh, the question to ask. And money, uh, money's not the most important thing in life, I'll tell you. Uh, health and happiness is much more important than, than money. And that leads us to the next question. Would you work at a career you love and make less money, or would you work at a career you don't like and make much more money? I would never work at a career that I, that I don't like. And so I would work at one where, where, that I really enjoyed myself and, and made less, for sure. Okay, we only got a couple more uh, minutes. Uh, how can a young entrepreneur without credit develop capital to start a business or obtain capital to start a business? I think we went through that with, when we talked about borrowing money from relatives, friends, getting an angel to, to support the business partner, joint ventures, that type of thing. Are there any secrets to sales, to selling? Yeah, I think organization, knowing the product, uh, 
being an organized person, having a very good follow-up system, being persistent, not overselling. Uh, depending upon what you are selling, you have to take you have to take a different approach. I think it's very important to know your customer, know your product, know your customer. Uh, you approach different customers in, in different ways. Uh, probably our last question. Do you still work much or just play golf and travel? Still a work. Uh, I'll tell you, I was an 80 hour a week guy, 80, 85 hour a week guy. I'm about a 45 hour a week guy now, but I am smelling the roses a lot more uh, since I uh, sold my business. The question the other day was, you know, how did it feel getting, you know, selling your company for $150 million? Well, by the time I sold my company, I'd already been making a lot of money. I was paying myself over a million a year and making 10 million a year. And so I, the thing was, I was putting that money back in the business by growing it. And so where you really start pocketing money is when you stop growing, when you sell or you stop growing your business. As an entrepreneur, you really don't have a lot of cash laying around until you stop that growth. And so uh, I bought myself a boat, I bought myself an airplane, I did all of these things, and, and I enjoy those things. I'm smelling the roses, but. Uh, but that wasn't much of a, uh, of a shock to me, except that I'm thinking, oh boy, Uncle Sam's going to get a big piece of this, you know. All right, that's it. Gail Limoran. Thank you so much. Uh, just a couple of announcements uh, before closing here. Uh, first of all, you can greet Mr. Limoran and Mr. Wilkes in the lobby. He'll be signing copies of his book. Uh, to succeed in business, bet on the jockey. These are for sale for uh, $5 to students, $10 to adults that are not students. He also has a small little book here that is absolutely terrific for $2. Sand in their calculators and other business insights. This is a great companion to your briefcase. Um, I want to thank again Florida Today and our sponsors, and particularly our campus ambassadors who forwarded your questions uh, up here, and I want you students to consider those who are not already campus ambassadors to possibly become an ambassador on your campus. Uh, it's a great honor. I also want to finally thank the King Center staff who did a great job in our setup today. And uh, I have a question for you. You don't leave yet. This is important. Listen to TV and have heard Dr. Phil. A few people. Well, Dr. Phil has a closing that I kind of like. It pays to see the Dr. Phil show. And um, today, we want you to feel good about coming here and consider coming every time we do this. We're going to do this again in the fall with a new speaker. And so if you would like to stand up and look under your seat, you may find a nice surprise. If you find something under there in terms of United States cash, why don't you just sing out? I got one. There may be an empty seat next to you that somebody might have left and you may find a piece of cash. If you're an adult, give the money to the student. <laughs> and if you're a student, go buy the book. We want to thank you very, very much for coming. We'll see you in the fall. <laughs>